quantum transport that is quantum mechanics plus transport transport generally in physics refers to electrical transport or transport of charge carriers such as electrons or holes to the system now when we say quantum transport it actually means the manifestation of quantum nature of electrons in transport now you might ask all right but many of the properties that we use in the transport such as band gap effective mass these are all derived from quantum mechanical nature of electrons that is true but those are electrical properties those are, those are material properties but when we say quantum transport we will observe or we will observe the quantum nature of electrons whereas the classical transport still treats the electrons as particles but even though the properties are derived from quantum mechanical principles before we get into the details of the quantum mechanical nature of electrons let's take a quick look at the classical transport okay the transport study or the electrical transport study generally refers to the measurement of current as a function of voltage or voltage as a function of current but you can actually do this characterization or this measurement as a function of various other parameter such as the magnetic field the applied magnetic field the applied electric field there can be another electric field in addition to the field that you are applying to drive the electrons through the system It could be strain in the material or as a function of the intensity of electromagnetic radiations on the material these are all transport studies okay but now when we observe the quantum mechanical or wave nature of electrons in transport then we say we are in the regime of quantum transport okay in classical transport let's consider a very simple device probably the simplest device that you can have is a resistor it's a piece of material with certain resistance resistance is nothing but the ratio of voltage to current in the material okay what i have here is a picture where the electrons are considered as particle which is undergoing various collisions with imperfections in the lattice various things in the material okay now the picture here is you basically consider electrons are particle they undergo collisions with uh, various collision center in the material i'm not going to define what are those collision centers at this point there are details to it okay this is just an overview now then electron will lose energy as it moves through the material because it um, it actually loses energy that means it is going to lose its speed also at the same time so there will be a statistical nature for this transport so there will be some velocity v is an average velocity is a statistical number again when you apply an electric field e across the material then electrons will move from one end to the other end. this movement is somewhat analogous to the movement of grains of sand through a 
hour glass. You can consider this resistance as the small constriction at the middle of the hour glass, where the motion through the whole system is defined by this constriction here, where the fan is going to move through a lower velocity because it collides with each other and it also collides with the poles of the container. This is the general or the statistical or the particle nature or the classical transport picture what we have for motion of the charge carriers. In this case, those are electrons through the system. Okay. Now, but when we consider the wave nature of electrons, we need to consider what effects that's going to bring to the classical or this picture of transport. What I have here is two landmark experiments. One is a scanning tunneling microscopy image of 48 iron atoms on copper. They are arranged in the shape of a ring. It's a very sophisticated experiment. And here is the approximate uh, size of the ring around 12.4 nanometer. Okay. And what you are seeing here is a plot, a three-dimensional plot or the three-dimensional image of the wave function of the electrons on the copper surface. These iron atoms are arranged on a copper surface. And you can see this is very similar to the standing wave patterns or the ripples that you are going to observe in a coffee cup or in a cup where you have some kind of liquid coffee or any soft drink or water or anything. So what you are seeing here is the manifestation of wave nature of electrons in this case. This is going to set up, the wave function is going to set up ripples just similar to that of on the surface of the water or liquid. Another experiment is the propagation of the electrons through a narrow constriction. This is similar to the propagation of water waves through narrow constriction, which is shown here. The white shape, the white colored region defines the small constriction where the electrons are going to travel through. As it travel further away from the constriction, you can see it is going to set up ripples or wave nature, which is here in this case is captured by a scanning probe microscope, which is going to sense the ripples on the wave function of the electron distribution, very similar to this measurement. So what we are seeing here is the picture that you are going to get is very much different from the picture what you have here for the transport of electrons through a resistor, which is just a particle picture, which is similar to the sand grains moving through an hour glass. Whereas in this case, it is more close to the water waves. I mean, this is, this is just an analogy, but there are a lot of details to it. And there are a lot of variations to this very crude picture of water waves to it. Okay, but those things we will address in detail as we move further. Okay, so the, what I am trying to say is you have completely contrasting pictures when you consider the big nature to that of the particle nature. And in this course, what we are interested is to understand the nitty-gritty or the details of this quantum transport and see how we can observe many of these interesting new phenomena and how can we come up with or how can we use these phenomena for novel devices. This is more or less a device physics course but in the premise of quantum transport. Now, The, when we talk about the device physics, 
we need to understand or we need to get some historical details of devices here we are looking into the first probably the first electrical device that is a switch or we call it a relay or it's a bistable device okay so what you have is you can open or close a switch by the application of current through a certain coil that is what is shown here this is invented by joseph henry in 1830 and this is an actual picture of that device this is a big microscopic large piece of device with a electromagnet when we apply current through this one this is going to create a magnetic field which is going to pull this arm and eventually will close the circuit so you can switch on or off the circuit I mean this circuit by the application of current which will create a magnetic field this is just a bistable device this has two states either on or it's off and this switch or this relay this electromechanical relay has revolutionized the then communication technology which was a telegraph what you are seeing here is the picture of a morse key sounder how by which you are going to send messages it has also only two states a long press or a short press okay and the picture here is professor moles sending the first telegraph message which is what had got dropped it's a statement from it's a sentence from bible the holy book bible but the meaning is it's amazing right that is the meaning of it and that has been transmitted from baltimore to washington or a telegraphic line and this is the picture we showing that occasion so as you can see the first device electrical device is a simply a electromechanical relay which has revolutionized the communication industry the communication technology then and nearly or more than 100 years later you have another switching device or another bistable device which is a transistor revolutionizing the whole technology which is responsible for the technology that we currently we have it is a transistor okay invented in late 1940s and nobel prize was awarded for that invention in 1956 which is a big piece of semiconductor when i say big it's like 1 cm in size and transistors are the backbones of every semiconductor chip or se every semiconductor technology that we are seeing this transistor is approximately 1 cm in size whereas the current transistors in the latest generation of processors are approximately 7 nanometer in size now we started from 1 cm and reach like 7 nanometer in a span of approximately 70 years the huge size reduction revolution that is what we are seeing over these years so this chart shows um um chart shows a plot of how 
or the sequence of this revolution, how this has happened. And I have marked major milestones here. Those refers to major technology breaks or major technology inventions or upgradation over the year. And currently we are at 7 nanometer size. When I say 7 nanometer, what that means is the, the smallest repeating dimension inside it. It could be the size of the gate, the size of the channel. I will get into detail what, what we mean by channel and all this in a minute. Okay. We started with something one centimeter and we reached something of the size of seven nanometer. Okay. And I have roughly divided this into three regions according to the according to the size. So I have something called macroscopic regime where the size is like a few micrometer or larger. And I have something called microscopic or something like a few nanometer or smaller and there is something in the middle that is we call mesoscopic. Mesoscopic actually means neither macroscopic nor microscopic. It is somewhere in the middle. Now you can see here as the size of the technology reaches the mesoscopic regime the whole development has been interlaced with various inventions in fundamental science or in fundamental physics, almost all of which have quantum mechanics at its base, at its border. Okay. So, superconducting tunnel junctions, two dimensional electron gas, two dimensional electron system. SDH means Subnikov de has oscillation, quantum Hall effects, fractional quantum Hall effect, GMR, giant magnetor resistance, all, almost all of this actually was considered as major inventions in the field of physics and all of them have awarded the Nobel Prize also. Okay. Now, the latest two milestones what I have here or inventions here, though are technology developments, but those are deep rooted in quantum physics, the quantum processors. So we have now reached a regime where the future processors need to be operating on quantum logic rather than the current classical logic. So what we are seeing here is a very strong cultural exchange for a very strong scientific and technology interactions give and take between the fundamental science and the advanced technology. The developments in technology which has caused, which has driven the, the large processors into the nanometer range has also enabled the scientific community to probe smaller solids in lower and lower dimensions or smaller and smaller in size, right? Now, at the same time, the development in fundamental physics also has enabled the technology to come up with newer and newer um, products. For example, the development in two-dimensional electron system has caused higher mobility transistors. The development in or the invention of the giant magnetor resistance material has come up with ultra compact hard drives, GMR, giant magnetor resistance material, and so on. Similarly, various other developments okay, are always supported by science, and science is always supported by the developments or driving this technology. So, the transport in this range, mesoscopic range, has always an interesting flavor of quantum mechanics. And in this course, what we are going to do is we will 
address most of this phenomena and address some of this in detail too. Okay. Now, when we talk about electrical devices and transport, this technology or this term MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, MOSFET is something we always have to refer to or we always have to understand. Without which we cannot discuss this course or we cannot, we cannot go further. These MOSFETs are the fundamental building blocks of all the processors that you have seen. Now the next couple of minutes we will just look into the operational principle of a MOSFET with minimum details. MOSFET is actually a switch. It is a switch. That is all. It has two states 0 or 1 or off or on. That is it. It has only two states. What you have here as a MOSFET is a piece of semiconductor, in this case it is P-type and you have some contact region which are N-type, I have put it N plus, what that means it is heavily docked and I have third electrode which is something called a gate here. With the application of electric field on the gate, I can create a layer of conducting region here. Okay. So in the normally, if you don't have the gate voltage, then these two regions are not connected and there is no current flowing through this. But the moment you apply gate voltage, there is a channel developed and you have current flowing through it. Okay. So, so this axis here in this plot is Vg and this axis is current. So when you have no gate voltage or low gate voltage, the current is pretty much off, zero. And when you apply gate voltage that is in this range, you have current, high current. So you can see this like bistable device. There is an off state that is correspond to this and there is an on state that correspond to this. There are two state on or off, right? And that state is controlled by the gate voltage Vg. That means this is again like a relay where you have conduction or you have a connection between these two N regions depending on whether you have gate voltage there or not. Depending on the gate voltage, you will get either an on state or if no gate voltage is an off state. So it is actually a semiconductor switch. That is what it is. It has actually two states on or off or 0 or 1. And this is what is there in all the processors or all the technology that you are seeing today. Okay, this is responsible for the zeros and ones in your in your computer or laptops or cell phones or whatsoever. Okay, now these MOSFETs, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. These MOSFETs have revolutionized the semiconductor industry. So what we have here is the one of the first MOSFET and a small integrated circuit which comprises of 16 MOSFETs which is made something like 60 years back, late 60s. Okay. And this technology is slightly different from the first transistor which was made 10 years back then 
which was a junction transistor made in a semiconductor material called germanium whereas these MOSFETs are done in silicon. There are a lot of technological advantages of silicon for silicon over germanium which we will not discuss much in detail here. What I want to point out in this case is if you look at what is the size reduction which has happened over 60 years is almost like we have 10 micrometer approximate size for the the dimension of the structure whereas we have something like tens of nanometer that means thousand times smaller okay the lateral size this is a small portion of an integrated circuit which comprises of the transistors and all the connecting lines and everything together you can see how densely it is, it is packed okay so as i as i mentioned in the previous slide this MOSFETs are like switches, okay. It has two states, an on or off state. So by the application of the voltage on one of the terminal, which is called gate, you can have a current flowing through the circuit, okay. When the gate is off, there is no conducting channel here and the current is zero. So we can visualize this the following way. So you have some kind of energy landscape where you apply a small voltage that is EV, which is mentioned here. And though we have applied a small voltage, but you won't get any current through the system or for current through this device because there are no conducting channel in the middle which you can visualize as a small as a barrier for the current and when you apply gate voltage you will get a conducting channel then this that is equivalent to saying this barrier is lowered something like this so that you can current can go through this so you have a barrier when the gate voltage is zero and you have a you have no barrier or you have conducting channel when the gate voltage is substantial or when you apply gate voltage. So those are your two states, the on or on and the off state. Now in the process of reducing the channel dimension, what you are effectively doing is you are also reducing the distance between the source and the drain. So you are making the whole structure here really thin. Okay. Now, when you do that, you are also going to reduce the width of the barrier as shown here. This is just a cartoon, just for to visualize what is happening. Now, remember, when you make the barrier really, really thin, at some point of time, you don't have a well-defined off state. It means when, they, when it's very thin and you are applying a voltage here, across the barrier this voltage is basically applied across this barrier okay so you will have you can have a leaky path from the source to drain because the barrier is not thick enough it's not able to stop the electrons completely when you apply a bias that is equal to saying that you have something like a tap the closed state of the tap is like the off state and when you turn it on it's on state but you have at some point of time you have seen taps which even if you close it completely still water will drip so it's a leaky tap it's a leaky tap okay. so you can have a situation when you reduce the size too small you can have leaky path or you, can, you cannot shut down it completely so for you are supposed to be here this is your off state and this is your on state but since you have a leaky 
tab or leaky system, your off state will be somewhere here because you still have a non-zero current when it is off. So this is equal to saying that you don't have a well-defined on and off state. Okay. And you can actually work out what could be the minimum dimension that is the limit for scaling that is called scaling limit. Okay, the minimum dimension that we call lambda that is given by this formula where epsilon channel is these are the dielectric constant which defines the field strength. Okay, divided by E O X is the dielectric constant of the oxide layer and D C H and D oxide as the channel and dielectric constant thickness. So for silicon this is approximately 10 nanometer and you can see that we are almost in that regime. So the current technology is 7 nanometer, the previous technology was around 10 nanometer. So we are almost in that regime. Okay. So what we are trying to say here is we are almost in the limit of this scaling. Okay. So what are the issues? We already looked into one of the issue that is you don't have a well defined on or off state or you can have leaky systems. Okay. Now second issue is something which is related to uniformity of operation. Remember as you reduce the number of as you reduce the increase the number of transistors and reduce the size of these transistors, you are reducing the size of the active region. And remember, you have dopants in the system which are randomly distributed. Though they are uniform, but they are also random. Okay. This is like what something similar to what is shown in this illustration here. Okay. Now remember if you have something like a 42 nanometer wide gate okay and 24 nanometer long okay if you have something like that an active region which is of that dimension for that you can cal you can say that you have approximately something like few tens of dopants underneath the gate now remember that these transistors consist of I mean these wafers or these chips consist of billions and billions of the transistor and it is not very easy to maintain the uniformity over the entire area where this number of dopants are same pretty much everywhere. If you have say thousand dopants and if they vary by one or two that is not just a very small fraction but if you have 36 dopants as mentioned here or if you have 20 dopants if you if you vary by few dopants that's a huge fractional change when you go from one device to other, other device so there is an issue but this is a huge trouble or there is a lot of hard hardship in maintaining the uniformity for or uniformity of performance over the entire efforts Okay. Now, what are the reasons or what are the issues that we discussed previously, whether it is actually a leaky path or it's a non-uniformity issue, these are all classical issues or these are issues created by classical physics or these are not connected to the topic that these are not completely these are not entirely connected to the topic that we are going to discuss. But there are really interesting problems those are put forth by the quantum effects of the quantum mechanics. Now the overall exercise that you are doing is reducing the size. Okay, Whether it is the thickness of the oxide or whether it is the channel length or whatever it is you are reducing size overall and 
quantum mechanics has some very interesting phenomena which is called tunneling. So even if you try to stop the electrons by creating a barrier, but you have a non-zero probability to go the to have the electron tunneling through the barrier or traversing the barrier. Okay. And there is a transmission probability over classically forbidden regions, which is exponentially dependent on the length of the uh, exponentially dependent on the length by this formula. What that means is really, really short lengths, you have a substantial probability for tunneling through the barrier. Just note that there is a negative sign here. Okay. Now, that is one way. Second thing is when you reduce it really, really thin, the gate oxide, you can also have the gate injecting carriers into the channel by quantum mechanical tunneling. This is not left to non uniform gate oxide or gate insulator where the carriers actually leaks to the channel. This is a quantum phenomena what I am mentioning here. Okay. So tunneling is an interesting though but a serious problem it is, it, which has its origin in quantum mechanics when you reduce the size. Now there is even a more interesting problem that comes from the confinement driven quantization or confinement driven discretization of energy values. So this cartoon here shows a typical MOSFET where you have a source region and you have a drain region and you have they are connected to some channel which I have shown here by the blue region. Okay, and the source strain characteristics or IV characteristics here VSD versus the current, you are you will get something with like this curve as shown, and these are two IV curves which are shown for different gate voltages. This is for one gate voltage, this is for another gate voltage, the two curves here. Okay. Now, the action of you reducing the channel, this dimension into the quantum regime or into really, really small dimension, and I call quantum regime is really, really small, something like a few tens of nanometer. Then, your introductory quantum mechanics says that when you have, when you make something very small, you can have discrete number of allowed states inside that. When you have a large region, you have a continuum state. States are continuously distributed. But when you make it very, very small, you can have discrete number of states and which are given by the some things. This is just a toy model, particularly in a box, but that is not always applicable. This is just to give you a feeling of the discreteness. Okay, this particular name box is only a toy model. This is not always applicable. This is general not seen. Okay, these potential wells have different shapes other than which is which is uh, not other than the square shape. Okay, but the point here is you have discrete states and discrete energy levels. So you don't have a continuum state as described in this case, let's consider that in, in case of a, in case of a classical system, you have continuum state here. Okay. It's all throughout field. Okay. Because you know, the spacing between the levels is inversely proportional to the size L. L is the size of the well. 
So when you have large L, the spacing between these levels will reduce and you will eventually get a continuum state. This is source, this is drain. Okay. But the moment you reduce the size, what you are going to get is a disc what is discrete number of states. And when you have discrete number of states and when you try to apply a voltage and measure the current, that is your IV here, you may not get something like this as you seen in the classical case. This is the classical case. Okay. Because what you are doing in this specific case is you are increasing the, the window, this window between the source and drain. Okay. Now when you increase the window, in this case you are continually increasing the number of states available for transport. But in this case, you are increasing the states one by one because your states are far separated and you will increase state in a discrete manner. What that means, the total current also can change in a discrete manner. Again, this is a toy model. So current will go like this in a stepwise manner. That is what is expected. So in this case, you don't have the typical MOSFET behavior is quite different. Okay. Now, this is another effect of quantum mechanics playing in. Now, let us relook the charge transport in terms of the electrons going through circuit. So charge transport in terms of electrons going in a discrete manner. So what we generally define is a current and we think it is a continuous quantity. Current at some point of time is certain ampere and that is kind of maintained uniformly. But current is not the fundamental quantity here. What is fundamental here is a charge which is going through a circuit at certain interval delta t time. So current is nothing but the charge, E is the electronic charge and N is the number of electron going per unit time, okay, going per certain amount of time delta t. But remember these electrons are discrete packets of charge. It is, they don't flow continuously. Though you can represent them by, by nature, but they are discrete packets. Okay. And when they go through something like a classical device, for example a resistor, There is a statistics playing there. Okay. So what you are saying here is at every moment, if you every in time interval delta t, there are certain number of electrons going through the system. At some point of time it could be say 100, next moment it could be 101. The next one could be 110, maybe next 99, 98, but on an average they are all around certain number, then there is an average number that is n here. So this plot here shows the number as a function of, it's a, it is actually a histogram, it shows the number n when if you take a snapshots of every second what is the probability of seeing certain number n that is this plot 
okay what is the probability of getting certain number n and the probability of getting a very low number and very high number are kind of very low because there is a statistical behavior it has a statistical behavior and more or less every time then if you define the current and uh, the resistor resistance value then on an average if, 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 if you define the voltage and the resistance value on an average same current flows through it when I say same current the number of electrons are more or less same but I am not saying it is accurate the same number every snapshots or every instance of interval delta t if you take measurement 1 measurement 2 measurement 3 most of the time you will be in this bracket if this is n this n is nothing but its average number which is going through it now this is a statistical distribution and there are other properties for the distribution such as the higher moments of the distribution like kurtosis which is sharpness skewness how symmetric this distribution is hence the variance the width of width of the distribution and when you measure this current you are losing a lot of information regarding the higher moments and these higher moments have lot of importance when you consider lower systems or lower dimensional systems where this electron electron phenomena such as electron electron interaction correlation and all these things are actually you now we are missing when you measure only the current when we say correlated transport first of all let's look into what is an uncorrelated transport just by a simple example people walking on a street in a market you can see you can say or people randomly crossing over the road in a market if you stay there at some point of uh, stay there for the whole day and measure it you will get a certain average number and what you would see there is no correlation between the people who are crossing the road or walking each other and what that means if there is an average number and there is a distribution to it okay and there is nothing interesting it's more or less it will be symmetric distribution but at the same time a army marching there is a perfect correlation between the people and you can very sharply say that okay this is a speed this many number of people the number of army men have crossed certain point okay and another interesting point here is here you have it's a noisy system noisy system when i say noise means the noise in the number of electrons for a solid here the noise in the number of people if you fix an average number say n crossing the row how much that our that number of people crossing the road is changing every second from the average number how wide the distribution is if i say n people and and what is the width of the distribution there is a noise to it okay now since there is no correlation between the people crossing the road and this width of the distribution will be actually proportional to n okay that is a noise to it that is a noise when we say when we call when we inspect electrical systems and associated quantity called noise to it that is the noise okay that is the randomness whereas when you have a perfectly correlated system which does not have much noise so in that case i can say okay 
n number of person cross at every time, every instance is the same n. There is not much width or distribution. That means there is a noise bunching. Okay. The correlation between the electrons here in this case the correlation between the people mesoscopic systems low dimensional system where there exists a perfect correlation between the transport of charge carriers those have very interesting property systems such as charge pumps condo effect okay you can see suppression of the short noise we will explain short noise at some point of time you can consider that's a noise electrical noise there are interesting bunching and anti-bunching effects you can observe all these things in correlated systems and these things are generally not seen in large three-dimensional systems such as a resistor or a bulk piece of material like a semi metal or a semiconductor unless there is some other phenomena called macroscopic quantum mechanics or macros macroscopic quantum phenomena okay so what we have discussed so far is quantum confined phenomena or low dimension systems can show interesting effects in transport this is just an overview. There are naturally confined systems such as a cluster or an atom with discrete energy states. There are a lot of interesting systems. But those you cannot measure the transport using current or voltage flows. Or you cannot measure the resistance of those systems with the multimeter. So, the systems what we are discussing here are mesoscopic systems or so systems whose dimension is above the naturally confined but far below the bulk systems such as a resistor or a capacitor or inductor. But we are interested to transport machines. So, what that means is we need devices or we need technology where we can go down to dimensions in the sub micrometer scale, but not to this scale. Okay, those are too small. That is possible only with advanced device fabrication tools such as lithography tools. What we are seeing here is a wheel which is lithographed with a dimension which is given a 40 micrometer. Okay, the wheel, the Sun Temple wheel which is lithographed using electron beam lithography with a size of 40 micrometer. This is the emblem of ISR TVM with a size 10 micrometer. And this is another device which is also lithographed using electron beam machine to sub micrometer scales. So, one interesting technology that we will be using all throughout. For making this device is lithography which has its origin in the technology development the semiconductor revolution now we also discuss that the quantum confinement gives discreteness and that energy scale is inversely proportional square of the distance in this case but you can say roughly that goes down as the distance goes up. And to observe that energy, 
scales or those those effect of those condensation you need suppress the thermal energy which is already there in the system so our the dimensions that we are interested is in the submicron regimes okay like 50 somewhere in this bracket what that means is the thermal energy should be minimum or that should not contribute much to your transport but that will create noise in your system what that means is the temperature range that we are looking is in the sub kelvin range energy that means you need lower temperature so the transport study in this case for quantum confined system now puts two const two constraints two restrictions number one that is on the size number two that's on temperature but these are actually interrelated to see quantum effects at room temperature you need systems of few nanometer but these are not addressable by your voltage and current probes you want to be somewhere in this range to see the effect of quantum confinement what that means is you need to be in this temperature range that naturally tells you one you need low temperature that means you need cryogenics and second thing it tells you you need fabrication tools which allows you to reach the dimensions of like hundreds of nanometer down to tens of nanometer okay